The leaves were so still that even Bibi thought it was going to rain. Bibi, who was accustomed to converse on terms of perfect equality with his little son, called the child's attention to certain sombre clouds that were rolling with sinister intention from the west, accompanied by a sullen, threatening roar. They were at Friedheimer's store and decided to remain there till the storm had passed. They sat within the door on two empty kegs. Bibi was four years old and looked very wise. Mama, be afraid. Yes, he suggested with blinking eyes. She'll shut the house. Maybe she got Sylvie helping her this evening. Bobby responded reassuringly. No, she ain't got Sylvie. Sylvie was helping her yesterday, piped Bibby. Bibby arose and going across the counter, purchased a can of shrimps, of which Calixta was very fond. Then he returned to his perch on the keg and sat stolidly, holding the can of shrimps while the storm burst. It shook the wooden store and seemed to be ripping great furrows in the distant field. Bibi laid his little hand on his father's knee and was not afraid. Calixta at home felt no uneasiness for their safety. She sat at a side window sewing furiously on a sewing machine. She was greatly occupied and did not notice the approaching storm. But she felt very warm and often stopped to mop her face, on which the perspiration gathered in beads. She unfastened her white sakwa at the throat. It began to grow dark, and suddenly realising the situation, she got up hurriedly and went about closing windows and doors. Out on the small front galley, she had hung Bobby's Sunday clothes to try and... She hastened out to gather them before the rain fell, as she stepped outside, Alice Labriele rode in at the gate. She had not seen him very often since her marriage, and never alone. She stood there with Bibby's coat in her hands, and the big raindrops began to fall. Alice rode his horse under the shelter of a side projection where the chickens had huddled, and there were ploughs and a harrow piled up in the corner. May I come and wait on your gallery till the storm is over, Calixta? he asked. Come long in, Monsieur Alice. His voice and her own startled her, as if from a trance, and she seized Bobby's vest. Elise, mounting to the porch, grabbed the trousers and snatched Bibi's braided jacket that was about to be carried away by a sudden gust of wind. He expressed an intention to remain outside, but it was soon apparent that he might as well have been out in the open. The water beat in upon the boards in driving sheets, and he went inside, closing the door after him. It was even necessary to put something beneath the door to keep the water out. My, what a rain! It's good two years since it rained like that, exclaimed Calixta, as she rolled up a piece of bagging and Elise helped to thrust it beneath the crack. She was a little fuller of figure than five years before when she married, but she had lost nothing of her vivacity. Her blue eyes still retained their melting quality, and her yellow hair, dishevelled by the wind and rain, kinked more stubbornly than ever about her ears and temples. The rain beat upon the low, shingled roof with a force and clatter that threatened to break an entrance and deluge them there. They were in the dining room, the sitting room, the general utility room. Adjoining was her bedroom, with Bibi's couch alongside her own. The door stood open, and the room, with its white monumental bed, its closed shutters, looked dim and mysterious. Elise flung himself into a rocker, and Calixta nervously began to gather up from the floor the lengths of a cotton sheet which she had been sewing. If this keeps up, Jules sat there if the levy's gone to starn it, she exclaimed. What have you got to do with the levies? 
I got enough to do. And there's Bibi with Bibi out in that storm. If he only didn't left Friedheimers. Let us hope, Calixta, that Thorbent's got sense enough to come in out of a cyclone. She went and stood at the window with a greatly disturbed look on her face. She wiped the frame that was clouded with moisture. It was stiflingly hot. Elise got up and joined her at the window, looking over her shoulder. The rain was coming down in sheets, obscuring the view of far-off cabins and enveloping the distant wood in a grey mist. The playing of the lightning was incessant. A bolt struck a tall chinaberry tree at the edge of the field. It filled all visible space with a blinding glare and the crash seemed to invade the very boards they stood upon. Calixta put her hands to her eyes and with a cry staggered backward. Elisa's arm encircled her and for an instant he drew her close and spasmodically to him. Bont, she cried, releasing herself from his encircling arm and retreating from the window. The house will go next. If only knew where Bibi was. She would not compose herself. She would not be seated. Elise clasped her shoulders and looked into her face. The contact of her warm, palpitating body, when he had unthinkingly drawn her into his arms, had aroused all the old-time infatuation and desire for her flesh. Calixta, he said, don't be frightened. Nothing can happen. The house is too low to be struck, and so many tall trees standing about. There, aren't you going to be quiet? Say, aren't you? He pushed her back from her face that was warm and steaming. Her lips were as red and moist as pomegranate seed. Her white neck and a glimpse of her full, firm bosom disturbed him powerfully. As he glanced up at him, the fear in her liquid blue eyes had given place to a drowsy gleam that unconsciously betrayed a sensuous desire. He looked down into her eyes, and there was nothing for him to do but to gather her lips in a kiss. It reminded him of Assumption. Do you remember an Assumption, Calixta? He asked in a low voice, broken by passion. Oh, she remembered, for in Assumption he had kissed her, and kissed and kissed her, until his senses would well nigh fail, and to save her he would resort to a desperate flight. If she was not an, an immaculate dove in those days, she was still inviolate, a passionate creature, whose very defencelessness had made her defence, against which his honour forbade him to prevail. Now, well, now her lips seemed in a manner free to be tasted, as well as her round white throat and her whiter breasts. They did not heed the crashing torrents, and the roar of the elements made her laugh as she lay in his arms. She was a revelation in that dim, mysterious chamber, as white as the couch she lay upon. Her firm, elastic flesh, that was knowing for the first time its birthright, was like a creamy lily that the sun invites to contribute its breath and perfume to the undying life of the world. The generous abundance of her passion, without guile or trickery, was like a white flame which penetrated and found response in depths of his own sensuous nature that had never yet been reached. When he touched her breasts, they gave themselves up in quivering ecstasy, inviting his lips. Her mouth was a fountain of delight, and when he possessed her, they seemed to swoon together at the very borderland of life's mystery. He stayed cushioned upon her, breathless, dazed, enervated, with his heart beating like a hammer upon her. With one hand, she clasped his head, her lips lightly touching his forehead. The other hand stroked with a soothing rhythm his muscular so her shoulders. The growl of the thunder was distant and passing away. The rain beat softly upon the shingles, inviting them to drowsiness and sleep. 
but they dared not yield. The rain was over, and the sun was turning the glistening green world into a palace of gems. Calixta, on the gallery, watched Alice right away. He turned and smiled at her with a beaming face, and she lifted her pretty chin in the air and laughed aloud. Bobbent and Bibby, trudging home, stopped without at the cistern to make themselves presentable. My Bibby, what will your mamma say? You ought to be ashamed. You ought to put on those good pants. Look at them. And that mud on your collar. How would you got that mud on your collar, Bibby? I never saw such a boy. Bibby was the picture of pathetic resignation. Bobbin was the embodiment of serious solitude as he strove to remove from his own person and his sons the signs of their tramp over heavy roads and through wet fields. He scraped the mud off Bibby's bare legs and feet with a stick and carefully removed all traces from his heavy brogans. Then, prepared for the worst, the meeting with an over-scrupulous housewife, they entered cautiously at the back door. Calixta was preparing supper. She had set the table and was dripping coffee at the hearth. She sprang up as they came in. Oh, Bobbin, you're back, my, but I was uneasy. Where you been during the rain? And Bibby, he ain't wet, he ain't hurt. She had clasped Bibby and was kissing him effusively. Bobbin's explanations and apologies, which he had been composing all along the way, died on his lips as Calixta felt him to see if he were dry and seemed to express nothing but satisfaction at their safe return. I brought you some shrimps, Calixta, offered Bobbin, hauling the can from his ample side pocket and laying it on the table. Shrimps? Oh, Bobbin, you're too good for anything. And she gave him a smacking kiss on the cheek that resounded, Jovor Rapon, well, have a feast tonight. Om vom. Bobbin and Bibi began to relax and enjoy themselves, and when the three were seated at the table, they laughed much and so loud that anyone might have heard them as far away as Labrielle is. Alice Labrielle wrote to his wife, Clarice, that night. It was a loving letter, full of tender solitude. He told her not to hurry back, but if she and the babies liked it at Biloxi, to stay a month longer. He was getting on nicely, and though he missed them, he was willing to bear the separation a while, longer realising that their health and pleasure were the first things to be considered. As for Clarice, she was charmed upon receiving her husband's letter. She and the babies were doing well. The society was agreeable. Many of her old friends and acquaintances were at the bay. And the first free breath since her marriage seemed to restore the pleasant liberty of her maiden days. Devoted as she was to her husband, their intimate conjugal life was something which she was more than willing to forgo for a while. So the storm passed and everyone was happy. The End <laughs>